So you know what I'm going to ask you to do, right? Turn to your neighbor and say, I love you. (laughs) Even if you've just met. All right, Ron, we've done what you told us to do. Found somebody to love. Amen. It's the Sunday after Easter. And remember last week, I said, we don't know how the story's going to end. That after Good Friday, after the crucifixion, after the disciples watched their beloved die, They thought the story was over. But Easter Sunday morning, there was more to the story. Amen? Amen. Well, a week later, there's still more to the story. So this morning, I want to invite us into a little bit of an examination of one of those very particular friends of Jesus. Now, sometimes he's gotten kind of a rough reputation, but this morning I ask you to just... Suspend that belief, because we're going to talk about Thomas. Thomas, one of the 12 disciples. Thomas was that disciple that, for whatever reason, when we read in the four Gospels that are traditionally found in our version of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, it's kind of painted in a light of he wasn't just quite sure. Now, see, I used to live in the state of Missouri, or if you're from there, it's Missouri. And every good Missouri citizen had a license plate, and it said, show me. And so they're known as the show me state. Well, I believe Thomas was known as the show me disciple. Well, let's just, let's look at what traditionally many of us have heard about Thomas. And I remind you that in unity, we look at the characters of these stories metaphysically. We look beyond the literal or the words that we read. Uh, One of the things I like to say is we look, we look to the space between the words for a little more inspiration, for a deeper understanding. And so, I join us in this story. We're in the book of John, which we know is a mystical book. And we're in the 20th chapter. And this is after Jesus has already risen from the tomb. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was one of the twelve, was not there that day. And so the other disciples told Thomas later that we've seen the Lord. And he said unto them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. So his friends have come and said, look what you missed. Where were you? Did you decide to skip church the Sunday after Easter, Thomas? You can imagine. They were saying, look what happened, and you missed it. So Thomas probably got a little bit proud and said, unless I actually touch it, I'm not going to believe it. Well, a week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, and I'm going to ask you to pause for a minute. He simply said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. 
Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. It never says that he actually touched. How often in our own life do we have a belief that we say is important to us? How often in our life do we find ourselves having a momentary experience and finding an exception to that belief? So let me be a little more specific. In unity, we often hear the phrase, there's one presence and one power in my life, God the good, omnipotent, or omnipotence. How often do we sometimes take a breath and see the train of our thinking and realize, "Uh uh-oh, we were looking for an exception to that belief that there's one presence and one power. For you see, I think that's part of the the story of Thomas for us is that in moments of doubt, are we going to build a mansion and live in doubt? Are we going to let ourselves keep going? Thomas, metaphysically, in unity, when we talk about Thomas as one of the 12 disciples, he represents one of the 12 innate powers that unity teaches is within each of us. And one of those powers is understanding. Thomas represents understanding. What if it was in his doubting that there was greater understanding, not only for himself, but for the other disciples? What if in his doubting, there's a greater understanding for us that it's okay to ask questions? Now, I know I'm talking to a unity audience, and unless you were born in a family where there was a unity minister, you probably weren't born in the unity church. Raise your hands if you were born in the unity church. Got one right there. For the most rest of us, there came a point in our spiritual exploration and evolution that we ask questions. And it's okay to ask questions. What if we begin to see Thomas not as that doubting disciple, but we see Thomas as that disciple who gives us permission to ask questions. Hmm. Over 50 years ago, there is a legend that there was a peasant shepherd in a remote part of Egypt, and he came upon a large vase, much larger than these, and within that vase were some texts, the Nagamati Library. And there was lots of controversy over these texts because scholars, pretty much up until that time, thought this book called the Bible was it. That's all we had. We didn't know any more about the story. And yet, one of those texts was the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is considered one of those mystical writings. I remember being in Unity classes, and I asked one of my professors, and I said, I understand about the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Mary, but you know, we, we, we can't teach those from the pulpit. They're not in the Bible. That unity professor said, oh, really? And so what scholars have continued to explore and to theorize is that the Gospel of Thomas perhaps really is some of the oldest of the stories of Jesus. So in the Gospel of Thomas, there are 114 verses, um, but they are all prefaced with this. These are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which Thomas wrote down. So maybe our doubter had another job. Here's the one that I want to bring to to light today. Remember we had that questioning, doubting Thomas aspect 
of who Thomas was. And now we have someone who is writing down what he believed were the most important things that the teacher said. Verse 3, Jesus said, If those who lead you say to you, See, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, the kingdom is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. Now, if that was a teaching by my mentor, I would think it's actually asking me to ask questions. To put before not only the teacher or the culture or the elders of the community, but to our own inner sense of what is truth with a capital T. To ask those questions. To ask those questions of ourselves. Because that's part of how we get to know, K-N-O-W, ourselves. I gave myself the Easter treat and drug my family with me last Sunday evening to the movies. They even tried to talk me into letting them go see, I think, Captain America two, two theaters over. <clears throat> but I wanted to go see Heaven is for Real. Has anyone had a chance to see Heaven is for Real? All right. I'll try not to do any spoilers. Yet there was a scene in this movie about a man whose little boy, while he was in an operation, quote-unquote, went to heaven. There's a book it's been on the bestseller list, so this is based on a true story. And this little six-year-old boy came back from the experience of, of that surgery talking about things he really could not have known, talking about people, having images of people that he interacted with during this, uh, what some called a near-death experience. The interesting piece of this story is physically there was no evidence of him quote-unquote dying on the operating table. So he had this experience. A, a young boy has an experience that not only intrigues the community, his presence, his presence about himself, which if you spend any time with five, six, seven-year-olds, they're still in that place of the magic. Not magic as in fairy tale, that place of wonderment. That place that asks questions with no shame. That asks questions not from a place of, I don't think you're right, but from a place of, the joy of simply understanding. And so, the main character in the story is the father. He's a minister in the Midwest. And the town wants to know what he believes. Because you have to remember, it's in a paradigm of, of a Christian church where the minister is still on an altar. Put up on that pedestal. Let me step down quickly, for you all think I'm on one. The people say, Pastor, what do you believe? Did your son go to heaven? Did he meet Jesus? And this creates a crisis of faith within this minister. And one phase of his journey, the minister says, I don't know, but I know he saw something. What a test of faith. To know that there was something that happened, and he doesn't want to 
play into fantasy, and he doesn't want to discount what's possible. Any of us have a, a level of discomfort when we have to stand in the land of I don't know? Thank you for being so honest. As my husband will say to me, Honey, you just need to do the research and find out the information because you just always do better once you know the information. But what happens when there is no information to know? We're left with belief. We're left with an awareness that perhaps our cognitive understanding and our heart understanding are not the same. And that's okay. So last week I told you a little bit of the story of our, um, our families learning we need to find a new house because our landlord, as wonderful as he is, is going to come back and he needs to live in his own house. And that, that was difficult for me for several, um, several months. <clears throat> but it was not difficult for Ogan. I see you. I probably should let you just tell this, but I'll let you hear it through my perception. So um, one of the things we've done in our life is when it's time to find a new place to live, I, I have learned that sometimes it's good for me to just get out of the way. Take my doubts. I can sit with them. But don't let the doubts be the filter with which the search, the research, the questioning happens. And so I've known that Ogan has been affirming and in prayer and in what he says and how he looks at this opportunity to find a new house. I've known that he was very clear. I said, okay, you and Joy go find it. You and our daughter, our 12-year-old, you guys, 13-year-old, you go find it. Well, there's one little interesting caveat, and you may have heard me tell this story before. A congregant gave us a hot tub about eight months ago. I love it. And I especially love it at this time of year. But when I found out in October we'd be moving, I was like, well, there goes the hot tub. I just got to enjoy it while I can. Ogan said, I affirm we're going to find the right and perfect place with not too much yard, because he's done with yard work. X number of bathrooms, you'll have to ask him about that. And a place that will take our hot tub. I said, that's crazy. No renting landlord's going to want us to bring a hot tub. Elgin said, this landlord said, have at it. I said, yeah, but that's an exception. We've been really good tenants. We actually saved the house during the hurricane when a big tree fell on the roof. Elgin's like, nope. Going to find the place for the hot tub. I was like, my doubts were getting bigger. I was no longer in the tent of doubt. I was building a mansion of doubt. They went to look at a couple places, blah, blah, blah. And they came back after seeing the fourth place. And Ogan said, we walked out on the deck. I looked down below. And the owner of the house said, yeah, we're tearing all that up. We actually, this morning, that used to be a hot tub, and we can't get the wiring out from under the deck. Ogan said, don't touch anything else. <laughs> Came home and told me there was a house with a hot tub with owners who were willing for us to bring our hot tub. I was like, really? <laughs> I needed to take down a few more bricks from that mansion of doubt. <laughs> Tuesday afternoon, we signed the lease. That's the townhouse. I think they were clapping for you, honey. <laughs> Pay him no mind. If you see him on his phone, I promise he's not texting. He's actually typing something I said. I'm sure it's because he wants to document that I said he was right publicly. <laughs> What can we learn from not only our own journey, but each other's journey? 
someone named Thomas's journey, someone named Jesus's journey. What can we learn? How do we bring that into our life? One of the keys, and one of the reasons I believe in unity, we still celebrate Easter. By the way, that was someone's question from two weeks ago, so here's the definitive answer for me. One of the reasons that Jesus still plays such an important role in our own spiritual evolution can be summed up by Bishop Shelby Spong. He wrote in the book, Jesus for the Non-Religious. Jesus' power is the power of human wholeness that ultimately opens, invites, and enables human beings to step beyond defense lines where incomplete humanity always hides in order to experience full humanity. Divinity is met when this humanity becomes so whole and so deep that one sees a defenseless, powerless one who is capable of giving himself away fully. And I would add, Jesus demonstrated that divinity as one so whole and so deep after the resurrection that there was a defenseless, powerless one capable of giving himself away fully. Perhaps that is the action we are also invited to live in. That we know the presence and the power of this infinite love that lives within us as the kingdom and outside of us as the kingdom. That we live it so deeply that we are giving away our personality. We are so resonating with that divinity within us. We are so trusting that place of inner wisdom. We're so aware when we are standing behind a wall of defense or doubt. When we're willing to get out of our own way, and that's basically what I was doing. That story is about a house. We all have a story. What is that thing you are willing to believe differently this day? Namaste.